Thanks for coming tonight. I, we tallied our results from our little survey that I wanted to, everyone to take. I was just curious um, as far as how many non-believers out there we have. And um, it looks like we had um, about two-thirds of y'all say yes, you do believe dogs have strokes, and then about a third of you said no. So um, I'm actually happy to see that. Um, I'm hoping this presentation will um, show you that, yes, indeed, they do have strokes, and, and we can talk about all the aspects of that. So what exactly is a stroke? A stroke is the sudden onset of non-progressive focal brain signs that occur secondary to cerebrovascular disease and they must last for greater than 24 hours. And this is usually associated with permanent brain damage. A transient ischemic attack is similar, but the signs resolve in less than 24 hours. These can be associated with permanent brain damage, but they can also um, be completely normal and you may not see anything on, on imaging. Strokes are the third leading cause of death in people. And we think that strokes are probably much less common in dogs than in people, but I also think they're probably underdiagnosed at this point. There's probably a lot more patients out there that have strokes that um, we just don't see because they get better on their own or they just don't get diagnosed um, or they get misdiagnosed. And the long-term prognosis is, is thought to be better in dogs than in people, and it mainly res revolves around trying to detect and manage underlying diseases. So we'll, we'll quickly go over the blood supply to the brain, just so that'll make more sense when we're talking about strokes later. Um, talk about how they occur, the different classification of them, the actual diagnosis, the underlying causes, and then the treatment and prognosis. So the, the major arteries that supply the brain are very similar between dogs and people. And so the internal carotid is the most important source of blood to the brain, but there's also a substantial amount that um, gets there through the basilar artery as well as the external carotid. And the internal carotid arteries join with the basilar artery at the base of the brain, and this forms the circle of Willis, or the arterial circle, as some people call it. And then off of this circle comes the major arteries that then supply the cerebrum and the brainstem and the cerebellum. There's also a, um, a caudal communicating artery that also contributes to this circle, which is outlined in, in yellow. So the cerebrum is supplied by three pairs of arteries. We have the rostral, the middle, and the caudal cerebral artery. And then the cerebellum is supplied by two pairs of arteries. The rostral cerebellar artery, which comes directly off the arterial circle, and then the caudal cerebellar artery, which comes from the basilar artery. These main arteries then give rise to deep and superficial perforating arteries, and occlusion of one of these is what leads to what's called a lacunar infarct, which we'll talk about later. So it's important to understand that the metabolism of the brain is solely aerobic, and so it really depends on a constant supply of oxygen and glucose to maintain function. The brain is very metabolically active, and it receives 15% of the total cardiac output and consumes 20% of the total body oxygen. And blood supply is maintained at a pretty constant um, rate, as long as your arterial pressure stays between 50 and 180. And so the brain is able to, to basically auto-regulate its blood, its blood flow as long as your systemic blood pressure is between 50 and 180. Whenever your blood flow um, drops, whether it's because systemic blood pressure drops below that range or you have some sort of occlusion, is when it drops below 40% is when it's considered inadequate. And once it actually drops below 15%, is when we get irreversible injury, regardless of whether blood is restored to that region or not. The neurons are the most susceptible part of the brain um, to lack of oxygen, followed by the supporting cells, and then your, your vasculature. And there are also specific areas to the brain that are more susceptible to injury than others. And these include your cortex, the thalamus, the hippocampus, and some of the basal nuclei. When brain tissue becomes ischemic, the ATP stores get depleted after about four minutes. And then there's two main things that happen. You can get some anaerobic glycolysis and you get acidosis, and then you get failure of your sodium potassium and your calcium pumps, which that then leads to edema within the cells. The two basic types of strokes are ischemic or hemorrhagic. And ischemic is by far the most common type in both people and dogs. 
And it's due to occlusion of a vessel from typically either a thrombus or an embolism. And hemorrhagic is just as it sounds. It's bleeding into the brain. And I think a lot of people, when they think of strokes, think of that as being more common, but it, it's actually pretty rare. Strokes can then be broken down in several different ways. Ischemic strokes are classified based on which vessel they affect, the size, so if it's one of the major vessels like the middle cerebral, it's a territorial infarct. If it's one of the smaller vessels, it's a lacunar infarct. They're based on the age, the presence um, of secondary hemorrhage, which even though it's an ischemic infarct, we can see secondary hemorrhage, and then the mechanism by which it happens and the underlying cause. For hemor hemorrhagic strokes, they're classified according to where the bleeding occurs, whether it's in, a, in the ventricle, subdural, and as well as the size, the age, and then the underlying cause. So talking just about ischemic strokes, again, it's usually due to an embolism or a thrombus that can form directly within one of the vessels in the brain. It's the, the, the most common type of stroke that we see. And again, a territorial one is one that involves one of the major vessels. And the most common one is the middle cerebral artery or the rostral cerebellar artery. And again, lacunar infarcts involve the smaller vessels in the brain. Embolic strokes are those that occur due to a blood clot or a piece of thrombus that is formed elsewhere but then travels to the brain. The most common example of this in people is due to atrial fibrillation. We don't know um, in dogs, I'd say, what the most common um, underlying cause of this is at this point. Some of the proposed causes are neoplastic emboli, septic emboli. We can see fibrocartilaginous emboli that make their way to the brain, and um, parasitic emboli have been reported. And again, I wanted to bring up a, um, a TIA, um, which is a temporary cerebrovascular accident. And this, again, is something that where the clinical signs resolve in less than 24 hours. Um, most of the time in people, they actually resolve in less than an hour. So they can be very brief episodes. And I'd say it's very hard to prove something like this in a dog, because oftentimes there's not going to be any evidence that we can find on an MRI. But I'd say a lot of the patients that I've seen in, in reports that have had a stroke that's diagnosed if you question the owners, there'll be reports of brief episodes that they'd seen previously. So I, I think that they occur, and potentially we should be paying maybe more attention to these things. Um, and people, they're um, taken very seriously, because in the person that has a TIA, about a quarter of them will have an actual stroke within five years. And um, there's even up to a 10% risk of having a stroke within 48 hours of having one of these. So if, if someone goes to the hospital with these sort of complaints, they're going to take it very seriously because there's you know, a 10% chance they could have a stroke within two days. Those thrombotic strokes are those that occur due to obstruction of a vessel that um, forms within one of the vessels in the brain. And this is thought to be less common in dogs, um, but some of the underlying diseases that potentially could lead to this would be things that lead to a hypercoagulable state, like protein losing nephropathy or enteropathy, um, Cushing's, and potentially cancer. And these often occur in the smaller vessels, so these lead to lacunar infarcts. Atherosclerosis is one of the most common causes of either thrombo thrombosis or embolism in people. And we're becoming, um, realizing that this is probably more common in dogs than, than we thought. In people, the initiating factors are things like high blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes. Um, there's genetic factors that play a role in this, obesity, and then poor diet. So a lot of these things don't necessarily correlate to dogs, but there are some things that can lead to atherosclerosis in dogs, like hypothyroidism, hyperlipidemia in schnauzers, diabetes, and then potentially Cushing's disease. So this is just kind of what is atherosclerosis. Um, I had to look it up when I was reading about this because I didn't know exactly what that meant. You hear that term a lot, you know, talking about people, and so it's Basically, you get degeneration of some of the lining of the vessels, and you get formation of these large amounts of connective tissue. When platelets become exposed to this, um, 
they can aggregate and then form a thrombus, which then can lead to also emboli. There has actually been a study that looked at 30 dogs on necropsy that were diagnosed with atherosclerosis and they compared them to a group of control dogs that did not have atherosclerosis and what they found was in the dogs that had atherosclerosis um, about three-fourths of them had an underlying endocrinopathy with hypothyroidism being most most common. So hemorrhagic stroke is occurs when a blood vessel either ruptures or there's increased permeability for some reason. And even though these only account for a much smaller amount of strokes, about 15 to 20%, they account for a third of all stroke deaths. So they're often you know, much more devastating. They can, um, unlike ischemic strokes, there can be some progression of symptoms up to three days as the, the hematoma enlarges, and then we can also see a lot of edema in the brain secondary to the hemorrhage, which is very irritating to the brain. There's two main causes of hemorrhagic stroke. There's primary, which is due to hypertension, um, and this is considered pretty rare in dogs. And there's secondary, which is due to abnormalities of the vessels, which can either be congenital or acquired. So things like arteriovenous malformations, aneurysms, neoplasia of the vessels, vasculitis, and coagulopathies. AV malformations have been reported in dogs. There's been about 20 case reports that I could find. And the most common symptom that was reported in association with the AV malformation was seizures. And oftentimes these are clinically silent until the patients get older. The reported ages that I found was between 5 and 14 years of age. In people, the average age um, for which symptoms develop is 30. So even though these are congenital, there may not be symptoms initially. And the treatment for these in dogs, which there's been very few reported, but um, is either surgery or radiation. An aneurysm, unlike the AV malformation, is considered to be an acquired abnormality of the vessel, which is usually due to chronic hypertension. And so, again, we think this is fairly uncommon in dogs. It's, it's more well-recognized in people. These usually occur near the circle of Willis, so when they rupture, blood can spread throughout the subarachnoid space very quickly, um, and these can be fatal very quickly. Whether we have an ischemic infarct or we have a hemorrhagic one, the end result is the same in that we're losing oxygen and nutrients to the, to the neurons. Eventually, if that happens for long enough, cells will die and we'll lose function. But we can have recovery because cells in surrounding regions can take over the needed functions. So the average age of dogs with a diagnosis of stroke is eight years, but there is a pretty wide range. Occasionally we can see it in very young dogs. And there's so far not been any um, sex or age or breed predisposition, but there's lots of reports um, of cavaliers and greyhounds. So they, they do seem to be overrepresented. Some of the things that have been found looking at some of the papers is small dogs seem to have um, cerebellar infarcts more commonly, and large breeds tend to have forebrain infarcts more commonly. And it was interesting, I, I found in one paper that um, almost half of dogs that were diagnosed with a cerebellar infarct had a history compatible with a TIA when questioning the owners. In almost half of all cases of stroke, no underlying cause can be found. This is true in people as well, and these are termed crypt cryptogenic strokes. In dogs so far, the most common underlying diseases are Cushing's and kidney disease. There's other ones as you can see here, but again, about half the time, we don't find a, a reason. And in people, cardiac disease is thought to be a very significant association with strokes. And I'd say thus far we haven't found a big association with that in dogs. I still think it's a potential underlying cause, but doesn't seem to be as important as it is in people. And I put um, PPA up there as a question mark, because there hasn't been a proven association between the use of that in stroke in dogs, but there has been in people to the point where pretty much most medications with PPA have been pulled off the market for people due to its association with strokes. And I've seen personally several dogs that we've diagnosed with strokes that 
have been on PPA. So whether or not that's the cause, it's hard to actually prove that, but I think there's probably an association. So there's lots of, um, lots of articles you can find out there about the use of PPA in people and the risk of strokes. So these are the main risk factors for people. And as you can see, animals certainly share some of these, but a lot of these aren't applicable to our patients. There's been one study thus far that looked at the um, occurrence of hypertension in dogs that were diagnosed with stroke, and what was found that about a third of dogs that were diagnosed with stroke had an elevated blood pressure, but in all of those cases they found an underlying disease that the blood pressure could be contributed to. So we don't think that so far primary hypertension, which is not common in dogs, is necessarily associated with stroke. The other thing to be aware of is that, at least has been shown in people, that after a stroke you can have hypertension secondary to the stroke because the body's trying to maintain blood flow to the brain. So whether or not that occurs in dogs, we don't know for sure, but you just have to be a little bit careful diagnosing hypertension in a dog that just had a stroke. Potentially it may be secondary. Clinical diagnosis is going to be based on a patient that has an acute onset of neurological signs that are referable to the brain with no progression. I think the big key here, if you have progression over more than a day, this is really not something that should be a differential diagnosis. The symptoms can vary a lot. It really depends on what part of the brain is involved. So pretty much any symptom referable to the brain could, could be seen. Again, the forebrain and the cerebellum are the most commonly affected areas, so we'll go over those specific signs. Some of the earlier reports about strokes in dogs reported seizures were one of the more common presenting signs. Some of the more recent papers, however, have found a much lower incidence of that, and I don't know if it's before. We're getting better, we're getting better at diagnosing these and realizing some of those other cases maybe weren't strokes, but, um, but so it's really variable. I'd say in my personal opinion, I don't feel like a seizure is one of the more common things that I see in dogs that have you know, found to have strokes. It, it is something that we can see, but I, I'd say there's other symptoms like vestibular signs that I see more often. Specifically when it comes to an infarct in the forebrain, which we're talking about either the cerebrum or the thalamus, um, things that you can see again are seizures but I don't think that's always the most common sign. More commonly, what I see is change in behavior, or change in mentation, so dementia. You can see um, visual deficits, contralateral to the lesion, so opposite the lesion. Compulsive pacing and circling are, are fairly common. Ataxia is up here, I, and I bolded that, because typically you're not gonna see ataxia with a forebrain lesion due to, due to something else the sort of classic forebrain lesion, like a dog that comes in with a big brain tumor in, in the cerebrum is that they may be demented and they may be circling, they may, be having, they may have visual deficits, but they're not gonna have an obvious ataxia. And so a stroke in the forebrain is the except, kind of the exception to that rule. You may have an obvious ataxia in these patients. For a brain stem, um, cerebral vascular accident, you can see pretty much any of the cranial nerves affected. All of your, your cranial nerves 3 through 12 come from the brainstem, so any of those could be affected, including cranial nerve 8, which would give you vestibular signs. You could see either a generalized paresis, a quadriparesis, or you could see a, um, a hemiparesis, which is going to be on the same side as your lesion. When it comes to a cerebellar cerebrovascular accident, the signs can be very similar to the brainstem in that you'll often see vestibular type signs like nystagmus and a head tilt. The one thing that kind of separates this is there's often a hypermetric character to the ataxia and you could also potentially see intention tremors. Another thing you can see which is kind of unique to the cerebellum is you could see menace deficits but their vision is completely normal. So they may not menace, but they, they have vision. And so this is an example of a dog with a cerebellar lesion. And what I want you to really notice about this, and it'll play again, is this dog has a head tilt, so we know it's got some sort of a vestibular lesion, but the pronounced hypermetria in that right front leg. And so whenever you see something like that, that degree of hypermetria, you should be thinking about cerebellum. And then specifically looking at this dog, 
when you see that the significant hypermetria is on the opposite side of your head tilt, that automatically tells you this is in the cerebellum. You don't get a head tilt opposite the side of these sort of limb signs unless it's in the cerebellum. Not that that tells you the diagnosis, but you could look at this dog walking down the hallway and be able to tell he's got a lesion in the cerebellum. So you wouldn't confuse this dog with something like a dog with idiopathic vestibular disease or old dog vestibular disease. I also did want to bring that up, as I think idiopathic vestibular disease is probably the condition that gets confused the most with a stroke. They can look very similar. Um, they both can have a very sudden onset of a head tilt, falling. The difference is when it's a stroke, your lesion is either in your cerebellum or your brainstem, so it's a centrally located lesion. When it's idiopathic vestibular disease, the lesion is out in the ear. And so we'll go over some of the distinguishing signs. But they, they definitely can be hard to distinguish on initial exam, especially when you have a really ataxic dog that can't even stand up. It's hard to do proprioception and look for potentially other things that could help you distinguish between them. With either of them, so you could have a head tilt, you can have strabismus, you can have nystagmus, ataxia, rolling. So all of these things could be seen with whether it's old dog vestibular disease or any sort of lesion affecting your brainstem or, or cerebellum. The way to distinguish between them is the most reliable things are to look for proprioceptive deficits. So if you have proprioceptive deficits, whether they're on the same side or opposite your head tilt, that's going to tell you it's a central lesion. If you have a um, hypermetria, that usually will tell you it's cerebellar. And then if you have vertical nystagmus, that tells you it's either brainstem or cerebellar. So you just have to be careful when you're looking for nystagmus because there's definitely some dogs that where it looks like it's almost vertical but it has just a little twist to it and then it's rotary. But if you have what is a true vertical nystagmus, then even if you don't have the proprioceptive deficits, then you're looking at a central lesion. So that's not a, a patient that has idiopathic vestibular disease. So this was an, an older dog that presented for an acute onset of a right-sided head tilt and ataxia. So you can see how he, he falls to, that, to the right side towards the ataxia. So just by looking at this dog, you know, knowing that this was a, an acute onset, my two main differentials without, before doing anything further would be idiopathic vestibular disease or an infarct. What you don't see in this video is we check this dog for nystagmus, which we do by um, elevating their head, laying them in right and left lateral recumbency, as well as putting them in dorsal recumbency. And this dog had a horizontal nystagmus, which again could be either a central lesion or a peripheral lesion, but he had no um, proprioceptive deficits and no other, no mentation changes, nothing else. So we suspect idi idiopathic vestibular disease. And this dog improved over a few days. So there's still a chance he could have had an infarct, but idiopathic vestibular disease was, was more likely. Get a definitive diagnosis is going to require a necropsy, which we hope most patients aren't undergoing to get diagnosed. But the closest we could get to diagnosis is typically going to be an MRI. So your history and your symptoms may be supportive of this, but to try to get a diagnosis, MRI is typically going to be the best chance we have. CT is useful in some instances, and we'll, we'll talk about that. CSF is sometimes performed, and it's more so to rule out other things. It's not, there's no specific findings on CSF for, for an infarct. And then oftentimes we're trying to just rule out other things as well. Some differentials for acute onset of neurological signs are, as we mentioned, idiopathic vestibular disease, trauma, which you'll usually have that as part of your history, but not, not always. Um, there are some toxicities that can come on very acutely and have similar signs to what you may see in a stroke patient, like this dog here, who was a, this is a metronidazole toxicity. Hypoglycemia. Hepatic encephalopathy, while we typically think of that as a more insidious type onset, could sometimes present acutely. Meningoencephalitis can definitely present very acutely. That's one of the other main rule outs in dogs. Specifically, it's if it's more of a middle-aged or a small breed dog, usually we're dealing with 
you know, a lot of times older or large breed dogs, that's not so much a major consideration, but if you're dealing with a, a smallish breed dog and it's middle aged, that's another big, big rule out. And also neoplasia. And again, we don't think of that as having an acute onset, but there are definitely cases that um, can be very tricky such as this cat. It was a 12-year-old cat that presented for an acute onset of neurological signs. The owner swore that this cat was normal as of three days ago and then suddenly found his cat in a sort of torticollis type position and was very ataxic and um, demented. And prior to that, the owner had not noticed any symptoms. The cat had improved. It had this had start, the symptoms had started about three days before it saw me and it had improved by the time it saw me. So we thought potentially this cat had a stroke, but a cat had also received steroids at the onset of its symptoms. And so that was, we said, well, we don't know if it improved on its own or if it was the steroids. And the owner elected to go through with an MRI and the cat had this really large tumor here that obviously didn't just show up. So some animals can be very good at hiding symptoms or they just, think go unrecognized. The main things that patients with an ischemic stroke should be evaluated for are hypertension and then if that's found you're usually looking for an underlying disease. Most of the time it's not going to be primary so things like looking for endocrine diseases, kidney disease, specifically protein losing nephropathy. So even if your your kidney values are normal, a urine should be checked and metastatic disease. And then still, I think heart disease should be something that's considered, even though we don't know if, the, um, if that's such an important thing like it is in people. When it comes to hemorrhagic strokes, the things that you should be screening for are coagulopathies, again, hypertension, and metastatic disease. But when it comes to MRI versus CT, there, we do have both options to look at the brain. And there are definitely some differences to be aware of. When it comes to people, CT is usually the first test done. And one of the reasons is it is it's definitely faster than MRI. And one of the things they're trying to do in people is determine if they're a candidate for TPA, uh, which is a thrombolytic. And the main, one of the big contraindications to given TPA is hemorrhage. So they're trying to really figure out as fast as they can if this is a hemorrhagic stroke and rule that out. So a CT is usually done first and so they can try to get that out of the way to then figure out that patient can get TPA because there's a very limited time window for which that can be given. We're not so much dealing with that in our patients. MRI is, is definitely more sensitive than CT for looking at um, for infarcted areas of the brain due to ischemia. So, but it, it can also pick up hemorrhage. So to me, there's no big advantage to doing a CT over an MRI. And then specifically when it comes to looking at stuff in the brainstem, CT is very poor. We can't see, especially something like an infarct, which could be fairly small, you're not gonna see that on a CT. So this is really where an MRI is needed. We'll, we'll go over some MRI images um, just to give you an idea of what, what it looks like, but what, what's gonna happen is typically the lesion's gonna be confined to a specific area that correlates to a specific vessel. It's usually in, within the gray matter. And there's usually no mass effect, which is a, one of the things that distinguishes it sometimes from a tumor, which we'll see some pretty big MRI or some pretty big strokes on MRI. And there's no mass effect, and that would be very atypical for a tumor. MRI can also be very useful for determining the age of an infarct, if it's a hemorrhagic infarct. Depending on the state of the hemoglobin, there will be different um, changes on different sequences. So you can, we can use that to, to tell when it occurred. So this isn't something that you know, I, I expect you all to, to really know. It's just um, kind of a, something to be aware of. This is a, um, a dog that has an infarct. This is in the, considered a territorial infarct. It's in the region of the middle cerebral artery. And what we're seeing over here on the left, this is called a T2-weighted dorsal plane. And this is our infarcted area. And you can see the hyper-intense area, that, which is the really bright white, is um, within the gray matter, which is pretty typical. And they, they usually have a pretty well demarcated area. And then you can see it over here on, this is a, um, what's called a axial image, that this is the 
the infarct here. And that's a pretty big area of brain that's affected, and yet you don't have a mass effect, meaning the brain's not being shifted over. If you had a tumor that large, you're going to have a big mass effect in the brain. This is also um, an infarct involving the middle cerebral artery, which again is one of the, the common arteries that's involved. I think this shows a little bit better just kind of the outline of this, and then again, that you don't really have, you can see here's midline, it's not really shifted over significantly. This is an example of a lacunar infarct, so it involves one of those smaller perforating arteries right here, and then this is just two different types of sequences that we do that this helps edema stand out, so it just helps it stand out more. Some of them are, are fairly small and they can kind of hide almost within the CSF if they're adjacent to like the sulci or a ventricle, and so this would help it stand out because it takes your CSF and it, it, makes it, it makes it dark, so other things that have a lot of edema will stand out. This is an example of what we see with the pretty classic infarct of the rostral cerebellar artery. And this is um, the axial image. So you're looking at the brain basically kind of from the back. And this is your cerebellum right here. Underneath it is brainstem. This is CSF right here. This is um, what's called your mesencephalic aqueduct. So this triangular area here is our infarct. And then on a sagittal image, which is like a lateral, you can see the, the whole rostral part of the cerebellum here is involved. And then this is again the flare which helps it stand out against the CSF. There are some additional images that can be done on MRI when the lesion's not as characteristic as you'd like or you're having a hard time distinguishing it from other things. So there's things called a diffusion weighted image which helps distinguish different types of edema in the brain. There's different types we can see and with certain types of things like cancer you'll see a, one type of edema with things like this you'll see a different type of edema and this just helps kind of distinguish that so this is what's called diffusion weighted and this is called an apparent diffusion coefficient and it when it's black like that that's consistent with a stroke this is a cat I know I haven't really mentioned cats in this so far um, I didn't mean to really leave them out they do have I'd say similar issues as dogs, they do have strokes, and we'll, we'll talk specifically about um, one, one thing that can lead to strokes in cats at the end. Um, but this is an example of a cat where you can see there's this bright area here and here. They don't necessarily look like they're contiguous, but then this is the diffusion weighted image, which shows that it's a contiguous lesion and this was con consistent with a stroke. This is two examples of a hemorrhagic stroke. This is a specific sequence that can be done on, um, with MRI that where hemorrhage, regardless of the age of it, is going to be black. So this is a single hemorrhagic lesion in a dog, and then all these little black holes right here are multiple small hemorrhagic infarcts in a dog. This is an example of what's called magnetic resonance angiography, and this is also can be done to try to, to pick up vascular lesions. It's not commonly done yet in dogs. Um, it can be really difficult to perform. You have to have someone who's experienced in performing this. Also with a lot of, um, with different breeds, it can, it can be really hard to do, but this is just an example. And you can see these are the carotid arteries. And then you can see here the um, circle of Willis. So treatment at this point really consists of supportive care. We don't have stroke-specific treatment in dogs like they do in people, which we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. But really, you're just trying to support them through this. So if some of these dogs that have pretty severe signs and they're recumbent, it's about, you know, a lot of it's about nursing care and, you know, helping to take care of them until they can improve and, and get home. And the other thing that sometimes needs to be managed is elevated intracranial pressure. It's typically not a big issue with an ischemic stroke. So majority of the time, since strokes are typically ischemic, we don't really see high intracranial pressure, but it can be an issue with a hemorrhagic stroke. It, this time, it's not believed that supplemental oxygen is going to help unless the patient is actually hypoxic, which is typically going to be from an underlying disease, not from the stroke itself. 
You do have to be careful again with um, blood pressure management. You don't want them to be too hypertensive, but that is the body's way of trying to make sure the brain gets perfused. So unless they're at risk of end organ damage, then you don't want to try to lower their blood pressure. So pretty much unless they're like 180 or above, you don't want to try to lower it, but you also have to be careful that they're not hypotensive because again the the body's trying to maintain perfusion to the brain as much as it can. Steroids have been shown to not be of use in both people and also in studies that have been done on dogs which aren't many there's not been shown a difference in outcome with steroids or, or no steroids so at this point I don't use steroids in these patients and they, I'd say majority of them get better and so I don't think it's, it's needed. The tissue plasminogen activator or TPA is the main treatment in people and it's used to, to break up a clot. The, there's a pretty strict criteria for using this in people and that's why we don't use it in our patients. Typically it has to be given within three hours of onset of symptoms. I think there are some places that will give it up to four and a half hours. So if, if you don't know when the symptoms started, let's say just like in our patients a lot of times the person's gone all day, they come home and their, their dog is showing these symptoms, we don't know when that started. And same thing for people, sometimes they can wake up with these symptoms and they don't know when they started and in, in people like that they usually won't give this. You have to have uh, a known time when this started and then again it has to be within three hours and there are contraindications to giving it and so a lot of things have to be done before this can be given so you can see how a lot of people aren't eligible for this treatment they say about a quarter of people actually make it to the hospital within the three hour window and then out of those um, you know the quarter of those people only about eight percent of them actually qualify for this because they have other conditions or diseases which don't make them candidates. So it ends up being used in only about 1 to 2 percent for human stroke patients. And there is a 6 percent, even in those patients, a 6 percent rate of cerebral hemorrhage. Other thrombolytics that have been used in the past include mainly streptokinase, but it had a really high rate of um, bleeding in the brain, about a quarter. So that's no longer um, really in use. So really at this point, I don't think TPA has ever been used in veterinary medicine, to my knowledge, that I could find. The prognosis is, I'd say, considered fair to good. There's been about a 30% mortality rate. Half of those are probably due to the underlying disease and not necessarily the stroke itself, and, and half of them are due to the stroke symptoms not getting better. The prognosis has not been shown to be related to motor function, so even in dogs that present non-ambulatory, they don't necessarily have a poorer prognosis than that dog that, that comes in, you know, just circling and, or with a head tilt. What has been shown, though, is if there is an underlying medical condition that led to the stroke, those patients are going to have a shorter lifespan as well as a higher chance of having a recurrent stroke. And the recurrent strokes typically occur between 5 and 10 months after the first one. So again, the overall prognosis is considered better in, in dogs than in people. And there are different reasons for that. One of the main being that dogs are less dependent on what's called the pyramidal system, so kind of some of the upper centers of the brain than people are. The majority of recovery is going to occur within two to four weeks after a stroke. And you definitely may have some residual deficits, but most often dogs can still be very functional and have a good quality of life. We're just going to go through a few quick cases. The first case I wanted to present is a, um, a six-year-old Airedale that I was presented. This dog came in for an acute onset of cluster seizures. On initial exam, the dog was very demented and non-ambulatory. He had been treated with phenobarbital and steroids prior to being referred. At the time of referral, his um, CBC chemistry and urinalysis were normal. So the owners elected to proceed with an MRI, and this was what we found. So this was the example I showed you earlier. So this dog had a hemorrhagic infarct, and we can't be 100% sure that's what this is. There was also, potentially, this could be a hemorrhagic type of tumor. So we did go on 
basically kind of a, a cancer hunt as well as checking for coagulopathies. So this dog had a PT and PTT which were normal, his blood pressure was normal, chest rads and ultrasound were normal. So on follow-up exam three weeks later, this dog had no significant abnormalities on exam. So remember this dog presented recumbent and very demented and he was treated with going home with phenobarbital but no steroids were not continued. By six months later this dog had not had any further seizures and the owners wished to take the dog off phenobarb so we did start weaning that and one year later talking to them on the phone the dog had been off phenobarb and had not had any seizures and was considered normal by the owners. The second case is an eight-year-old female spade toy poodle who presented to us for an acute onset of ataxia, vomiting, and a head tilt. On exam, this dog was moderately to severely ataxic in all limbs. It was hypermetric. It had a right-sided head tilt. There was no nystagmus, but he did have mild proprioceptive deficits on the left side. Initial blood work that came with the dog showed that he had a pretty significant hypoalbuminemia and um, a four plus protein urea. So we had evidence that there was an underlying disease, but that still didn't tell us our diagnosis. Um, so the owners decided to go forward with an MRI. And this dog did have what appeared to be a cerebellar infarct, and it's fairly small. You can see it up there on this flare. It stands out a little bit more. This is in the cerebellum. And this is actually post, a post-contrast scan. You can see in the, the rostral part of the cerebellum, I don't know if you can see that, there's this white is contrast uptake. So this dog was diagnosed with a protein losing nephropathy and began treatment for that. One week later on follow-up exam, it was mildly ataxic, still had slight hypermetria, but the head tilt had resolved. Some of the testing that was done on this dog was a D-dimer, which was elevated. His blood pressure was slightly elevated, and an abdominal ultrasound was normal. After being on treatment for two months, it still had an elevated UPC, but it was now 7 compared to 24 when he had come in. And neurologically, the dog was normal. The third case is a 15-year-old female spade Shih Tzu who presented for ataxia, as well as dyspnea, a head tilt, circling, and mentation change. On exam, this dog was demented. It had a right head turn, which is important to recognize, not a head tilt. This dog was circling to the right, had mild generalized ataxia, and proprioceptive deficits on the right side. So I suspected this dog had a forebrain lesion. It was 15, and we were suspecting a possible brain tumor. The dog had been diagnosed with Cushing's disease, which was thought to be pituitary dependent about a year prior to this. And so one of the big differentials was the pituitary tumor in this dog. Um, and he had also been on prone for several years for incontinence, or she. And this was that dog's MRI. So it had, this is going from rostral to caudal. All these little black kind of punk tank things are hemorrhagic infarcts all in the brain. So we didn't know in this dog if this was the Cushing's disease. Even though it was on treatment, it's still possible to, to see something like this um, or the pro -in. This dog um, ended up kind of slowly declining over time. Um, he never, she never really got any better. And so I don't know if she was having constant sort of ongoing infarcts, but um, she was hypercoagulable. She had elevated D-dimer, but um, and eventually she continued to just pretty much stay demented and she, she did get euthanized, so I don't have a happy story ending to this one. <laughs> so not to neglect our cats, um, but there, there is a specific syndrome that's seen in cats that um, is believed to be associated potentially with Cudorebra infection, and it can be seen in young cats or old cats, and typically these cats are going to have acute lateralizing signs that are referable to either the cerebrum or the brain stem. And seizures can be um, fairly common in these guys. And it's believed that there's some sort of reaction to the cuterebra, something it secretes, or the actual cuterebra migration itself that affects the middle cerebral artery. And these cats can, can have an infarct of the middle cerebral artery.
So I've seen, I saw one of these in my residency and we've had one case here, so I won't say it's common, but um, the, the prognosis is very poor. I've not seen a cat with, with this specific syndrome where it was thought to be related to a cuteriba that actually survived. So you pull, a, pull it out and then stop the progression? No, because in the ones, the two that I've seen, you could almost like see a track going right through the brain, and so. Oh, okay. So it's the actual. That's what it looked like in the ones that that I've seen in some of the case reports. You can like see like a track basically going through the brain. So prior to the onset of this, one of the things that um, has been reported in some of the case reports out there is that these um, cats will have um, sneezing as one of their complaints prior to the onset of the neurological signs. And though we're talking about the brain, I just wanted to also mention that the most common vas vascular accident that we see in dogs is actually in the spinal cord, and that's the, your FCE, your fibrocartilaginous embolism. And this is where a piece of um, fibrocartilage from the disc becomes, um, occludes one of the vessels of your spinal cord. And we can also, typically see this on an MRI. So it may not stand out that much to you, but um, this brighter area in the spinal cord here is representative of what is likely an FCE. Again, a lot of times this isn't, we don't have a definitive diagnosis because that would have to be made on necropsy. And again, most of these dogs have a good outcome. So we try to look for these on MRI. Is there anybody here who would raised their hand who was a non-believer who has changed their mind. <laughs> I think for strokes and dogs that it's kind of shifted that there was a time when people would just say, oh, that dog had a stroke, and then it kind of was like, well, no, dogs don't have strokes. But I, I think at this point we can say dogs do have strokes, and um, we have, you know, necropsy evidence of it. I mean, a lot of the cases we see aren't definitive, but we have pretty good stuff now that we can put together to make a good case for, for it. So um, I definitely think something to, to keep in mind.